Hello, I'm Mark Krieger, immediate past president of the American Heart Association and director of the Heart and Vascular Center, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. And with me is Dr. Elliot Antman, past president of the American Heart Association from Brigham and Women's Hospital. And we're at ACC 17 in Washington, D.C. And this morning, Elliot and I had an opportunity to listen to some very important and impactful late-breaking clinical trials, Einstein Choice and Gemini ACS. So Mark, let, let's think about uh, what the, the basis of both of these trials uh, was. Uh, for over half a century, the oral anticoagulant that we've dealt with has been a vitamin K antagonist. And uh, as we know, there are new oral anticoagulants. They are direct-acting oral anticoagulants working specifically and targeting either factor 10A or factor 2A. And we heard some interesting information about a factor 10A inhibitor, rivaroxaban. Now the first of these, the Einstein Choice trial, dealt with a condition that you've been uh, managing and uh, investigating and teaching us about for decades now, and that's venous thromboembolism. And what, what did the, uh, the Einstein Choice investigators uh, do with their, their study with rivaroxaban? Right, so this was first of all a very well conducted trial. So Einstein Choice asked the question, can we use an antithrombotic agent, rivaroxaban, the factor 10A inhibitor, or aspirin, in patients who have had venous thromboembolism to reduce the risk of recurrent venous thromboembolic events. So essentially, the, the trial was developed as such. They enrolled about 3,396 patients, mm -hmm. and these were patients who had a documented deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism or both, and treated them in the usual manner with antithrombotic therapy for three to six months. It's at that point that they pose their question, if we extend treatment with either aspirin or with rivaroxaban, and I'll talk about the doses of rivaroxaban in just a minute, will one of those treatments versus the other reduce the risk of recurrent venous thromboembolic mm -hmm. events? It's important to note that when you stop anticoagulant therapy in people who've had venous thromboembolism, and you stop it within a year, there is about a 10% recurrence rate over the subsequent year. So in this, this trial, patients were randomized to one of three groups. Uh, they were randomized to aspirin. They were randomized to rivaroxaban at a dose of 10 milligrams PO daily, so less than we usually use, mm -hmm. or to rivaroxaban, 20 milligrams PO daily. And they're followed, it's an event-driven trial, but the follow-up was about one year. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that in patients who were placed on aspirin, they had an event rate of 4.5%. And by event rate, I mean recurrent DVT, non-fatal, or recurrent pulmonary embolism, non-fatal or fatal. Mm -hmm. In the group that received 10 milligrams of rivaroxaban, the rate of recurrent venous thromboembolism was 1.2%. And the group that received 20 milligrams of rivaroxaban, it was 1.5%. So in both groups of patients who received rivaroxaban, there was a significant decrease in the numbers of recurrent. So both, both better than aspirin. Both better than aspirin. And what about the bleeding? Was that a concern here? Well, of course bleeding was a concern. And, and the issue is if you put patients on an antithrombotic or an antiplatelet uh, regimen, uh, are there concerns about increased bleeding risk? And is one verse versus the other worse. So it turns out that with aspirin, the uh, event rate was about 0.3%, and with rivaroxaban, uh, either dose was about 0.4, 0.5%. All the rates of bleeding were low, and there's no significant difference between the two, mm -hmm. or between the three groups, actually. I took some careful notes, because I, I was impressed by their detailed analyses here, and it didn't matter whether this uh, index uh, uh, venous thromboembolism event was a provoked or unprovoked situation, or whether they had actually had a prior venous thromboembolism, or how long they had been on the prior oral anticoagulant. The results you're describing seem to hold up across all that's those right. analyses. That, that's really very important, because you know today uh, we often may discontinue 
antithrombotic therapy in patients who have had a provoked venous thromboembolism after a period of three to 12 months. Mm -hmm. And in this case, even in that group, it was continued. And although there was not a placebo group, uh, there was certainly a low rate of venous thromboembolism, recurrent venous thromboembolism in the rivaroxaban group. Mm -hmm. So even if aspirin had a negligible effect compared to placebo, we're still reducing that effect by 30, 25 to 30 percent in the patients who received either dose of rivaroxaban. Yeah, there was an interesting uh, panel discussing this, and you know, one of our colleagues, Dr. Jonathan Halpern, who's also done a lot of work in vascular disease and actually uh, chaired our task force on practice mm -hmm. guidelines, he was pretty impressed with the results. And I thought his perspective was that this could actually open up a new pathway for treatment uh, for patients who had had venous thromboembolism where you have equipoise as to whether or not you should continue some form of antithrombotic therapy. Uh, and this actually seemed to be quite uh, promising for rivaroxaban. Yeah, I, I would agree with Dr. Halpern. I, as I mentioned in, in the introduction, uh, this was a very uh, important and impactful trial and I think a potential game changer moving forward. So Elliot, the other trial we're going to be talking about is Gemini ACS, and this was a trial uh, looking at uh, antithrombotic therapy in patients who've had acute coronary syndromes. And this is an area clearly that you have been uh, very much immersed in for your entire professional career. What are your insights on this trial? Fascinating situation again. This is uh, a, a, a different situation than with the Einstein Choice trial. This was looking at a, an acute coronary syndrome population. Uh, and the question here was, what, what do we do with the antithrombotic therapy? We've been giving dual, anti uh, thrombotic, and dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor. So DAPT, dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, but now they, they tested an interesting concept which was called dual pathway inhibition. So some antiplatelet therapy and some inhibition of the coagulation cascade, again with rivaroxaban. So they looked at individuals who had had an acute coronary syndrome event and they had been uh, placed on uh, a P2Y12 inhibitor at the treating physician's discretion and that was either clopidogrel or ticagrelor and aspirin, and then they said, let's randomize individuals after a brief period of treatment with uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, and they said, let's just give them uh, rivaroxaban, uh, 2.5 milligrams twice a day, a pretty low dose, much lower than the doses you were discussing for VTE uh, prevention, uh, in combination with the P2Y12 inhibitor that they had received, uh, but no aspirin, or uh, DAPT, aspirin plus the P2Y12 inhibitor. And there, this was a phase two trial, also of about 3,000 patients, international multi-center, and its purpose was to actually see whether this was a safe approach, and they were mostly looking at bleeding, and did some exploratory analyses with respect to efficacy, and there were very encouraging findings here as well. There was really no difference in bleeding for most of the standard ways that we analyze bleeding. Timmy major non-cabbage significant bleeding or gusto bleeding or by the bark definitions. I believe that they showed that the uh, ISTH definition showed a slight increase when you use rivaroxaban in combination with a P2Y12 inhibitor, but not by very much. Uh, and there really appeared to be no difference in terms of efficacy. But this is a phase two trial, and it's going to need to uh, be followed up with uh, a much larger trial of a more definitive nature. But this opens up the concept, which I think is important for our listeners to uh, hear about, which is this dual pathway inhibition. And that may be a way that we treat patients uh, over the long term who've had an ACS event as opposed to the dual antiplatelet therapy, or DAP, that we've been using uh, for years. Uh, so these were both very interesting trials and started to explore extended uses of these new pharmacotherapeutic options that have been introduced, the new direct oral anticoagulants.
And, and really, if you think about it, there are situations uh, that we know when people use both dual antiplatelet therapy and an antithrombotic. Yes. And in those situations, of course, the risk of bleeding is, yes. is, is increased considerably, particularly yes. when aspirin is in the mix. Absolutely. So if you have dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor, and you add a third antithrombotic agent, some kind of oral anticoagulant, you're actually giving triple therapy. And the real concern there is bleeding. And that was actually the inspiration for doing the Gemini ACS trial. And although not a primary endpoint of this trial, you mentioned efficacy, ischemic events, which was mm -hmm. MI, uh, stroke, cardiovascular death, and uh, risk of stent thrombosis. Uh, the signals there, were they pretty comparable? Between they were the pretty groups? comparable. Small numbers of events because the total sample size was just about 3,000 uh, patients. So uh, this was a useful trial to kind of seed your thinking about whether it makes sense to go ahead with a large trial. And I, again, I think Dr. Halpern and Dr. Bott, who was another member of the panel, pointed out that you need these kind of interesting phase two studies that actually give you uh, the ground uh, work that decides whether you go ahead with a big clinical trial. It's a very efficient right. way to proceed. Absolutely. So a phase two trial so we're not ready to make changes in the way we manage patients Absolutely. yet. Absolutely. That's right. But at least it provides the evidence to support going on to a phase three trial. Yeah. Which so then I, I would think that the, the Einstein Choice trial is much closer to ready for prime time, as they say, mm -hmm. and is likely to work its way into the guidelines. The Gemini ACS trial was a very interesting one. Uh, it doesn't change current practice, but it's something we want to keep our eye on. All right. Well, very interesting morning, two terrific trials here at ACC 17.